So I think to understand early stage finance, you really have to understand preferred stock, even on deals that aren't selling preferred stock, like uh, convertible notes or safes, because even use of those instruments is dependent upon what the preferred stock looks like in the future. So preferred stock is the type of ownership that investors purchase in startup companies. Uh, the term preferred stock itself doesn't have a whole lot of meaning until it actually gets defined in uh, the negotiations of, of the financing. Um, that being said, there's a whole lot of convention that surrounds these investments. And so uh, when we're talking about preferred stock, we can have um, some idea of what it might look like um, upon implementation, even before uh, the terms of the deal have been negotiated, even before the terms of the deal have been contemplated. Uh, so at a super basic level, uh, preferred stock is just a different class of stock than common stock. Um, common stock is the type of uh, equity that uh, typically the co-founders and the employees would get. Uh, preferred stock will have certain rights, uh, privileges, preferences, and treatments uh, that are seen as favorable uh, to that of common stock. Um, this all sort of makes sense once we get into the details of it. Um, it'll sort of make sense as uh, the culmination of things that investors would typically negotiate for. So one of the core components of preferred stock would be a liquidation preference. Uh, this means that uh, the investors that put cash in uh, will get that amount of cash out. Typically, if it's a 1x liquidation pr uh, preference, then uh, they'll get that amount of cash out before any of the common stockholders can participate in the distributions of proceeds upon a liquidation. Uh, so in a situation where the company doesn't have a huge exit and the investors have put in $7 million, uh, then if there is $7 million cash, then that would go to the investors first uh, before any distributions of proceeds would go to the common stockholders. In a situation where there's a really big exit, the preferred stockholders would usually do better if they convert to common stock because then they'll have a percentage of the total distribution proceeds. Uh, so rather than relying on a non-participating uh, liquidation preference, uh, they would then get some you know, portion of the, the distribution proceeds uh, and basically evaluate those two, see which one leads to uh, a higher return for the investors, and then that's the one that the investors would choose. Other core components of preferred stock are anti-dilution protection. Um, this changes the conversion ratio of preferred stock to common stock. Uh, when you first start out, there's a one-to-one -one exchange ratio. So uh, every share of preferred stock is going to be convertible to one share of common stock. Uh, if there's a future financing or some other issuance of stock that is that depends on a lower valuation of the company than what occurred at the time that the investors got their stock, then that one-to-one -one ratio will change. It will turn into a ratio where it's uh, every share of preferred stock turns into more than one uh, share of common stock. Uh, which would allow the investors then to get a higher percentage ownership of the company than was originally contemplated. And this would be because of the dilutive financing or other issuance of equity where it's based on a lower valuation. This is a protection for investors so that the uh, company has a disincentive to go raise money at a lower valuation, which would devalue the investor's investment um, or to make other issuances of stock that uh, you know don't bring in some corresponding value. A couple of other areas would be uh, dividend preference, where uh, usually the preferred stock is going to have an 8% dividend preference over the common stock. Um, so dividends are the distribution of profits that a corporation has. And if the company is operating profitably and decides that it wants to issue some of those profits to its common stockholders, then the preferred stockholders are going to get at least 8% of their original investment uh, back as, uh, as a dividend. Uh, prior to the common stock being able to get any uh, dividends uh, paid to them. This one is based off of the notion that a startup, when it's taking money, is intending to you know, essentially burn through all of that cash so that it can scale, um, grow to a certain size. If it's, uh, if it's profitable in the early stages, there may be a question about whether it's actually reaching its full growth potential. And so if it is profitable, then the investors might prefer that there be some investment of those profits back into future growth of the company so that they can hit a bigger exit uh, rather than getting some sort of income stream from the profit distributions in the interim. Um, this is you know, really how uh, institutional investors would operate. Um, obviously, individual investors might have uh, different preferences on how they'd want to get returns on their investment, but at least for the typical VC, this is how they're going to be thinking. Um, so in practice, the dividend preference never doesn't really come up too much, uh, but it does act as a disincentive for um, A, for the company uh, not to scale um, and to actually have profit, um, which is 
generally seen as not uh, reaching the full growth potential in the early stages, um, and B, to you know, hold on to those profits or do something beneficial with them rather than distributing them to the common stockholders, which um, are usually going to be the founders and the employees of the company. There's usually some sort of board composition uh, that goes into at least Series A and beyond. A typical setup might be that there's a five-person board. Uh, two, two of the directors would be common stock directors, uh, two of the directors would be preferred stock directors, and then one would be of mutual choosing. Uh, this allows for a really balanced board where the investors feel like their rights are uh, going to be protected at the board level. Uh, the common stockholders would feel like their rights are going to be protected at the a board level and that you know both of them would be able to persuade uh, whoever it is of mutual choosing and that person would be the swing vote on uh, situations where there is some real balanced interests or uh, conflicting interests. It's not always set up this way. Sometimes if the common stockholders have a lot of leverage or just otherwise not interested in taking uh, money from investors who are going to want to have that level of board uh, representation, uh, then they're able to negotiate that there be less presence on the board from uh, the preferred stockholders. It could be that it's a seven person board or a larger board, or it could just be that there are less than two seats that are given to the preferred stockholders. Uh, and then on the flip side, sometimes you're going to have some uh, investors who you know really want to have uh, majority control over the board if they're going to put money into the company. Um, so it's usually a, a point of negotiation and investment, and it's usually dependent upon how much leverage the common stockholders have going into the investment. There's also something called registration rights. Uh, this is a contractual provision that allows the investors to force the company to register and go public, um, or if the company is already going public, um, to force the company uh, to allow uh, their uh, shares of stock to be part of that public offering. Uh, so this is one I tend not to focus on too much in the early stages because it's um, pretty premature at that stage for the company to be uh, thinking about what the rights are going to be between investors and the company. Uh, at the same time, it may seem a little scary for a company to enter into an investment transaction where um, you know, the investors you know, have a contractual ability to force the company to go public. Um, but practically speaking, the expense of uh, filing for an IPO is so high uh, and there's so much involved that it's you know, not something that's going to get triggered um, on a, a very frequent basis. And in those instances where it does, it's probably after many successive rounds of finance and other rights being negotiated um, closer to the time of the IPO. Um, there are also a lot of contractual rights that go to the investors. Um, some of what I described earlier is achieved through contract and some of it is achieved through amending the Certificate of Incorporation, which is the charter of the corporation. Uh, some of those contractual rights would be uh, the right to participate in future investments. Um, so investors, especially those that have large funds behind the initial investment, are definitely thinking about investments down the line. And if this is one of those companies that scales up and grows and grows and grows, they want the opportunity to be able to invest in those later rounds of finance. Uh, obviously, they're going to hope that they have a continued good relationship with the company and that the company just wants them to be the ones in position to lead those successive rounds of finance. You know, but in the situation where other investors are going to be taking that role, they want to at least have the contractual right to participate up to their pro rata share. Uh, so if they've purchased 15% you know, of the company at Series A, then when they get to Series B, they want to be able to purchase at least 15% of the Series B that's being offered at that point. An inspection right and information right is another uh, common one that, that goes into one of the contracts for investors. Uh, the inspection right is the ability to inspect the corporate records, the books of the company, uh, and the uh, information rights are uh, financial information um, and budget information that comes to the investors on a quarterly or annual basis. Uh, there's a right of first refusal and co-sale that applies to uh, co-founder stock and other stockholders that have more than one or two percent of the common stock. Uh, what this does is if a common stockholder is in a position where they can sell some of their stock to a third party, then the investors will get the right of first refusal on that sale. So the price and all the other sort of general terms that would apply to that sale, the investors can evaluate that and say, actually, we would like to take this sale. We'll pay you the same amount that the third party was going to, uh, but we're the ones that want to actually be the purchasers in this case. In the instance where the investors decide that they don't want to exercise that right of first refusal and they don't want to uh, be the ones that purchase, uh, maybe in some cases because the price is so high um, that they would say, actually, there's more incentive for us to sell alongside with you. So we're going to exercise the right of co-sale. And you know, if we're a 15% stockholder, then we'll be able to take 15% of the 
proportion of stock that you're going to sell to this third party and we'll sell uh, we'll convert to common stock or maybe even keep it as uh, preferred stock and we'll sell that proportion alongside your sale to this third party uh, there's something called a drag along where if um, typically if the board if the preferred stockholders and a majority of the stockholders approve a sale of the company then all of the common stockholders or all the large common stockholders um, and other investors um, are uh, bound to agree uh, to that sale and to waive their dissenter rights and other things that could impact the ability to do that sale in a clean fashion. So there's definitely more. I mean, th these transactions are, um, you know, 100 pages in transaction documents. And so a lot of little stuff can get negotiated in there and there might be some deal specific terms or provisions, covenants, etc. cetera. Uh, but the, you know, these are a lot of the general principles that apply. Um, a lot of the conventional stuff that, you know, when we say preferred stock, we can anticipate that these will be the things that get discussed and implemented into the corporation's structure uh, as a part of that financing. Like I said, it's important to understand the preferred stock transactions for the other early stage financing documents because those early stage financing documents are dependent upon the implementation of preferred stock and the sort of successive rounds of finance and uh, growth path of the company uh, that you know is typical for a venture-backed uh, company um, in order for those early stage instruments to work. A convertible note is a loan instrument, um, just a regular promissory note that has an extra provision in it that allows for conversion in the event of a financing and sometimes uh, in the event of maturity date and a sale of the company. Uh, the ideal scenario is that the company gets to a financing and that the loan amount uh, and whatever interest has accrued um, converts into the Series A or other series of preferred stock that's sold at that financing. Um, and that the loan is no longer outstanding and that the investor then has preferred stock in lieu of uh, the you know, promise to repay that loan. Uh, in this situation, um, the investors are basically deferring to convention uh, for a lot of the specific treatment that would apply. They're saying, we don't know what the preferred stock is gonna look like, but if we're talking about the VC space, uh, these deals are so conventional that all of these elements of preferred stock that you've discussed um, are probably going to be implemented into this. And, you know, in the rare, rare situation where something, uh, you know, unique gets uh, implemented, um, I mean, you know, there are so many other risks involved in a startup that uh, an unconventional preferred stock financing uh, might not be one of the primary concerns of investing into a, a convertible note financing. So a convertible note is usually going to have a threshold for the conversion and say, look, you've got to raise at least a million dollars. Um, sometimes it's more than that, depending on what stage of development the company is in. Uh, but if, at least if there's a million dollars of new cash coming into the company, you can sort of assume as an investor that this is going to have some sort of aligned interest with you, uh, that somebody's not going to put a million dollars into the company unless they're negotiating some favorable treatment for themselves as investors. A safe is uh, really similar to a convertible note. Um, essentially, it's just we don't explicitly call it a loan. How that might be treated from a tax standpoint is a different question, but at least uh, from the terms of the instrument itself, uh, it's not treated as a loan. And so that being the case, there's no repayment date and there's no uh, interest that's being accrued uh, while the balance is outstanding. Uh, the conversion elements still typically function the same. Uh, this is a little bit more standardized because Y Combinator is the one that authored the safe and they have a sort of templated version of it that everybody uses. Uh, these things definitely get uh, modified sometimes by investors. Um, you know, my, my pet peeve is that the safe is a, is a, a proper noun for uh, you know, a specific instrument that was created by Y Combinator. Um, and at the point that it's modified, it's no longer a safe. It's just a convertible security that somebody else has authored or, or modified. Uh, but still, you know, you may hear the term safe apply to something similar to a convertible note that's not explicitly a loan that's intended to be repaid and doesn't accrue interest in the meanwhile.